good. I'm going to tell you guys about my longest standing job to date, which was at Village Square in Calgary. Now, I worked as a lifeguard here throughout high school and my undergrad, and it was awesome. So we were Calgary's biggest wave pool. We were proud of the fact we had the most number of rescues in a given year. And on that note, that also meant we had the most number of drownings. Now, I'll share with you guys a case that uh, changed our practice that I also happen to be working for. So to give you some context, we had a part of the pool we called Drowning Alley. And what Drowning Alley was is the pool was a gradient. And as you got deeper and deeper in the water, there's this sweet spot where kids could no longer touch the bottom. And a lot of our rescues would happen here. If you think about it just being a beach, it is the same concept. This is a picture of our pool. It is lower resolution, but I wanna show you just, if you look to the far left of the screen, that's the beach. And as you get deeper, I've highlighted in red, this is the area I'm talking about. The day this happened, the pool was jam packed. So it was a weekend, we had tubes, we had flotation devices in the water, the waves were going, all of which are super fun. But as a lifeguard, it's actually your worst enemy because it obscures your vision and you can't really see much. I gave you an aerial view of the pool here. It was not this empty. But just to give you an idea, I've marked with stars where our lifeguards were. So this was in the middle of the screen at the top, the tower, uh, and then also to their far left. We also had, based on numbers, we had three additional guards at the time where I've marked with additional stars. So when one of our guards first noticed this and called for it on the radio, they noticed that something was off. And the thing about drowning is, like some things in medicine, it doesn't always present typically. In fact, it's not the patient or the person you see in the bottom left of your screen that's drowning. It's the person where the arrow is pointing. It doesn't look like the movies or Bondi Rescue. So in this case, the waves were cut, we had thrown the aids, we had thrown the tow ropes, and finally one of the guards jumps in to get the kid. She doesn't have a clear path though because the pool's just so busy. She's trying to navigate around a bunch of people to get there. And when she finally does get there, this kid's unconscious. So I was off deck at the time and I heard this radio call uh, to come out to the beach to bring the first aid kit and her AED. And I remember coming out to the deck to this horrifying scene of this 10 year old who was getting CPR. And by the time I got there, this kid started vomiting. I had the AED, we assisted him over into the recovery position. And he remained like that until EMS came. It was about 10 minutes, but it of course felt like a lot longer. Now you might have a lot of questions from this case, especially if you're the ER doctor, what are you gonna do if this patient now comes to your emergency room? What if you did get shocked with the AED? And what if the resuscitation is still ongoing? How will you set up for that? These questions and more I'm hoping to answer for you today. My name's James Gilbertson. I'm a third year resident here at the University of Ottawa, and I'm excited to take you through a dive into drowning. I have six objectives for everyone. The first is just that you learn modern drowning definitions and Canadian data. The second is improving your understanding of the pathophysiology and its relation to treatments of the past and then our current treatments. I want you to feel comfortable as a physician first responder to drowning, similar to responding to a medical emergency on a plane. I want you to be able to confidently lead your next ER recess if it is for a drowning patient. And finally, in urgent care, I want you to know when to be able to discharge, observe, or image these well-appearing drowning patients. Lastly, I'll take you through a few procedures or wilderness medicine survival strategies that could one day save your life. We'll start with the definitions. Now, I actually had a few questions from your survey about, well, what about the difference between saltwater or freshwater drowning? And that's easy. In fact, none of these terms exist. The World Health Organization came out with their definition and they outlined that drowning is simply the process of experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion or immersion in liquid. That's respiratory impairment from any liquid exposure. 
And this came out 18 years ago, back in 2005. So this isn't even new news. You can ask yourself a very simple question. Did the patient die? If they did, it's fatal drowning. If they didn't, it's non-fatal drowning. Now you can go on to farther subclassify this into three different categories, mild, moderate, or severe. Severe just being that non-breathing or unconscious patient, like I talked to you about in the first case. Mild being an involuntary cough. So I asked the group, have you seen a drowning in the ER? And 75 of you responded. Here's what you said. It was about split 50-50. So 36 people said, yeah, you know, I've seen a case of drowning. And the other half haven't seen it yet. So I looked at our local data. I pulled up Slicer Dicer just to see what our stats are in terms of who's coming to our ER and the number of drowning cases we'll see. I plugged in a couple drowning-related terms. And over the last year, I got a whopping one hit. So I wanted to go back to the inception. So I went back 10 years in Slicer Dicer, even farther. And you know how many hits I found? I got four. Now, is this just because drowning is so rare, we're not seeing it at the Civic and the general campuses? Or are we just not classifying this right? And I would argue it's the latter. I think there's a myth I want to dispel right away, and that's that drowning is incredibly rare and often fatal, with the minority coming to care. In fact, for every one child that drowns in the US, over eight will present to an emergency department. Here are your local Canadian stats. So we're seeing about four to 500 Canadians die from drowning every year. We're looking at over 4,000 eMERGE visits annually. And here's the local Ontario data from the National Drowning Report. So we're seeing over 150 deaths, 540 ED visits that are at least appropriately classified as drowning, and over 95 admissions for non-fatal drowning. So I'll give you some stats. This is for drowning mortality. So the people who are dying of drowning, 80% are male. Compared to the rest of the world population, it's actually a minority of kids who drown. You can see a little bit of the age breakdown in these graphics here. I'll show you now an infographic that's quite interesting about where this is happening. The majority are happening in lakes and ponds, rivers. Over 10% are happening at bathtubs at home. And finally, this article came out in CMAJ just about six months ago. This looked at the medical conditions and epidemiology of Canadians who drown. Found over a third had a pre-existing medical condition. Seizure, not surprisingly, being one of the top. Developmental delay also being there. What I found interesting was ischemic heart disease also had a two and a half fold increased relative risk of having a drowning event. And I'll talk to you a bit later about that. So to best explain the physiology of drowning to you, we're gonna do an exercise. When I count down from three, I'd like everyone to close their eyes, take a deep breath in, and hold it for as long as you can. Don't worry, this is totally safe. <laughs> You're gonna feel air hunger, and I'm gonna to explain to you what those feelings mean as you experience them. As we begin, I want you guys to visualize yourself in the environment above. One, two, three, breathe in. In these first few seconds, you won't feel much, but in the water, your body would be surging with stress hormones like epinephrine. You would enter a period of panic. Perhaps you're underwater and you can't figure out the right direction to the surface. Around this point, you'll feel a subtle pressure in your chest. That's air hunger. And that's your arterial CO2 levels slowly rising, telling your brain to breathe in. But don't worry, at this point, you can still override this. Research studies have found the average breath hold breaking point in healthy subjects like yourself is 87 seconds. For reference, we're not even halfway there at 40 seconds in. If you made it this far, you're likely experiencing more pressure in your chest as your air hunger rises. Your CO2 levels have risen with a surprisingly smaller drop in your oxygen. Very soon, your reflexes are gonna kick in and you'll take a large gasping inspiration. And some of you, that's already happened. A few of you might still be fighting the surge. 
when that reflex happens, instead of relief, you'll feel an excruciating sensation of water racing through your mouth and your nose. As it goes down your trachea, you reflexively can't stop coughing. And you swallow water as you try to clear your airway. This process can actually last minutes before you lose consciousness. Within the lungs, you're starting to wash out pulmonary surfactant, and this rapidly causes profound changes in your gas exchange and your lung compliance. This leads to atelectasis, inflammation, pulmonary edema. In the meantime, you've likely gone apneic, and shortly after, you develop bradycardia into a PA arrest. Now, you can catch your breath now. You can check in on your neighbor, and I'm going to refresh you on the absolute wild history of drowning treatment. Uh, just for reference, in the new Avatar movie, uh, Kate Winslet actually held her breath for seven minutes and 15 seconds. In total, that was about two and a half like, minutes. So this takes us all the way back to 1839, where one of the first published medical articles came out in The Lancet by Dr. John Hancock. In it, he describes the process of exsigation, which is sucking strongly on the nostrils of drowning patients to revive them. Interestingly, this is one of the rare times I found in old school medicine where a doctor didn't suggest naming the procedure after their last name. Heimlich and Patrick, they had no problems naming these biased maneuvers that had no evidence after themselves when it came to drowning. Now, the Heimlich we know has evidence for choking, and they went on in the 70s to publish article after article after article on drowning, but none of these actually were clinical trials. It's comparable to your friend from high school getting involved in a pyramid scheme and saying, you know, the model, the science, it just makes sense. But at this point, the American Heart Association, they had already come out denouncing this. It was still widely being misconceived by the public as a drowning treatment. And that's when a doctor who everyone in this room knows came out and published a paper just denouncing the procedures for drowning. Uh, this doc is perhaps variably respected in our group, Peter Rosen. Now, I'd love to read you the full Savage article here, but in the interest of time, I've summarized it for you visually. <laughs> I was really proud of this. Rosen, he goes on to say that there's absolutely no evidence and that it raises, quote, several concerns. He then systematically addresses them throughout the paper. Fortunately, after this, these proposed drowning maneuvers fade from the treatment spotlight. Now let's talk about drowning in the pre-hospital setting. And why does it matter for you? Well, you've likely received teaching about being the doctor responding to a medical emergency on a plane. In fact, Dr. Sanders gave a great round grounds on this just last year. But I can guarantee, however, you've probably never been taught how to be the doctor on scene responding to a water-based emergency. And to me, that's crazy. First, you can think about your next uh, beach or your tropical vacation, especially now post-COVID that we're able to travel again. How about all the times you were just by the water this last year when you weren't on a beach vacation? Maybe you were by Lake and Gatineau, you were swimming, you were paddleboarding, you were even running alongside the Rideau Canal. We spend a lot more time in water than we often think about in a given year. And it's certainly more time than you spend on a plane. Multiply that by a lifetime and it's easy to see why this is important. As ER trained clinicians, there are three things I'm going to teach you that I want everyone in this room to know and they don't involve getting in the water. The first just has to do with the order of your treatment. This is a map of Ottawa. This is showing all the pools in Ottawa, and they're all based on Life Saving Society curriculum. As of January 2023, all the pools in Ontario switched over. Before this, it used to be this battle between two societies called the Canadian Red Cross and Life Saving. They had a lot of differences between them, but one you should know, and one that was important, was the order of your treatment. The Red Cross, they said, for every patient, drowning or not, start with compressions. Life-saving societies said, if they're drowning, start with airway. So I talked to 
well, what about our pre-hospital providers and our paramedics? I talked to Dr. Dan Beamish, who did his pre-hospital fellowship here at the Ottawa Hospital, and he reached out to the regional medical director of RPPO. They found they don't have a directive that's distinguishing cardiac arrest from drowning, but of course the current guidelines emphasize still giving good ventilations. How about our medical guidelines? Now, there's ILCOR, and they suggest starting with CPR rather, or compressions rather than breaths. But this is in contrast to the ERC, and they say start with five rescue breaths. How about the AHA? They say two breaths. And the Wilderness Medicine Society, they say just start with breaths. And you, might, you might say, like, wow, like, slow down, I'm confused on that. So I'll go back and I'll say it again. Elcor, they're saying compressions. ERC, they're saying five breaths. AHA is two breaths. Wilderness and Ed, breaths. So what did you guys say? And not surprisingly, our group was similarly confused on what to start with. Here are your results. So of the 75 of you who voted, 40% said start with compressions. 27% said give two breaths, 20% five breaths, and then there's a few in the other categories. Of the other, there were three who said they would start with a pulse check. So let's go back to our table. And instead of telling you why all these other guidelines say breaths, let's start with the outlier, which is ILCOR and why they say compressions. So they did a systematic review. In my mind, this is the perfect resident research project why? Because at the end of the full text review, you have zero articles. There is nothing looking at should you do breasts first versus compressions first. In fact, you'll probably never get an RCT like that, because that's just not how our research designs work. So why compressions? Well, they say it prioritizes simplicity for the layperson. They do go on to say, though, in finer detail, that if you're a healthcare provider or if you're a lifeguard, Perhaps you could consider starting with rescue breaths first. So we're lucky to have um, one of our physicians here who is a member of the OCOR board, Dr. Christian Viancourt, who I had a chance to have a conversation with. And he emphasized essentially that, you know, rescue breaths are often the biggest barrier to initiating bystander CPR. And really, it's about maximizing public engagement. So let's go back to our table. Why do the rest of these articles and guidelines say breaths? And really what I was able to gather is this comes from two different sources. So that of bystander CPR data and IWR, which is, stands for in water resuscitation. So for bystander CPR, they found three studies that compared people who were pulled from the water, drowning victims, who got just compression only CPR versus those who got breaths. And the evidence was pretty clear. In fact, in one of the studies by Hubert, he found the association between if you received ventilations over just compression CPR, you had an almost sevenfold chance of survival. What about in water resuscitation? Now, this is a creepy looking picture, but I'll explain. This is the idea of providing ventilations to someone while they're still in the water for those unconscious apneic drowning patients. Now, there have been five studies to date that have studied this, four of which were done in mannequins, so we'll ignore those. But I'll tell you about the one study that was done in people. And for that, we'll travel to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. This article came out in resuscitation back in 2004. It looked at IWR and said, is it worth it? Imagine the Brazilian lifeguards on the beach look something like this. And the study, here are the results. I'll just draw your attention to the bottom of the screen, which is mortality. They found patients who got breaths in the water had a mortality of 15%, and those who didn't had a mortality of 85%, which is wild. But the truth is, if this came to Journal Club, this article would be lucky to get a one out of five for methodology. There's a lot of flaws with it. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen, over half of their patients, or almost half, were missing data. 
which conveniently they all had higher mortality. This was retrospective, and there was a huge selection bias on whether lifeguards would provide it. Now, we can't make much from this paper, but as we understand the physiology, and as I take you into the next part, looking at the uncommon rate of shockable rhythms, we know in these hypoxic arrest patients, using a breath-first approach is best for the drowning patient. I will say there's insufficient evidence, however, to say two breaths versus five breaths. What about AED and shockable rhythms? There's a systematic review on this. They looked at almost 15,000 patients, and they found the rate of a shockable rhythm was low. It was between 2 to 14%. So what about these patients? As I told you at the beginning, there was that study that suggested patients with ischemic heart disease had a two and a half fold increased risk of drowning. Now we know from the media that athletes and healthy people can undergo um, cardiac arrhythmias, particularly during exertion. What I found more, even more interesting was actually from US triathlon data. And this found that more than 70% of the deaths that happened during US triathlons occur during the swim phase of the race. Now, why is this if the race is divided into three parts and the swim is actually the first part, not even when athletes are exerting themselves the most? There's a lot of different theories for this, one being SIP, or swimming-induced pulmonary edema. I won't get a chance to chat about that, but I want to talk about, you know, is there something that could precipitate an arrhythmia in the water? I don't know how many of you guys remember the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge back in 2014, but I remember seeing a few articles that came out. This is in Forbes. They talked about the Ice Bucket Challenge can kill. You know, this water is cold. It can cause a deadly heart arrhythmia. And is that true? Because, in fact, if you look into Rosen's, they talk about immersion syndrome, which is syncope from cardiac dysrhythmias occurring when the body contacts water that's at least five degrees below core temperature. And that sounds nice and fancy, but what does the evidence actually show? So there's a lot of research by this guy called Trip Tan. He does a lot of drowning physiology research. He found that 80% of people had an arrhythmia on exposure to cold water, which is pretty impressive. But when you dive into the study, there's a sample size of 12, and these arrhythmias he's talking about looked at bradycardia with a heart rate less than 60, or just PVCs. So really not clinically useful, and certainly not VTAC or VFib. Well, what about those arrhythmias, right? There's a few case reports. This is a case series looking at autopsies of unexplained drownings. They found a few patients had these congenital mutations in their ryanidine receptors that are associated with catecholinergic VT. But this is really a loose association at best. When you look at all the guidelines I showed you earlier, their consensus is actually clear and unanimous across the board. That good quality CPR, ventilations and compressions, shouldn't be delayed in you getting an AED. Finally, I'm going to talk to you about the concept of positive pressure. Because we know that this can recruit collapsed alveoli. And I think the physiology just makes sense. But this is hard to study in a pre-hospital setting. This is a sheep model. So they looked at a bunch of intubated sheep, and they instilled either fresh water, seawater, down their ET tube. This is about one to three mils per kilogram of body weight. They measured lung compliance, which dropped by two thirds within five minutes of the water administration. Their work of breathing increased almost tenfold, and airway resistance went up eightfold. So I talked to one of our local experts, so Dr. Ariel Hendon in the ICU, about the concept of a PEEP valve, and she said, well, for the general hypoxemic patient, I essentially always use a PEEP valve. Right? You want to do everything you can to avoid the de-recruitment that comes with them not breathing. And this can include other techniques like a two-hand BVM, head-up positioning. I'm going to summarize this for you. Take a ventilation first approach before compressions, call for an AED early, but know that shockable rhythms are uncommon. And if you have it, especially with a BVM in the pre-hospital setting, 
you can consider adjuncts like a PEEP valve or a two-hand BVM-like technique. Now let's step into the recess bay for a drowning patient. Know that I'm not here to reiterate standard ACLS care to a room full of experts, but I'll highlight the nuances you need to know for running your next drowning recess. Research is still ongoing on this. In fact, this article came out just the other year in resuscitation, and this looked at the application of supraglottic airways in drowning patients in the pre-hospital setting before uh, they come to you, but it compared it to BVM and intubation. What they found was that the odds of survival to hospital admission and discharge was lower if patients had a supraglottic placed. There was multiple confounding factors for this, but one of the possibilities they said was because of higher airway pressures required to ventilate these drowning patients, leading to leakage around the device. Now I want you to remember, these are often hypoxic arrest patients. Airway is critical. Bagging may be difficult due to increased airway pressures, as we alluded to. These patients need a secured airway. And I would say you can expect it to be soiled given the aspiration that not only occurs during a drowning event, but that vomiting happens in about 60% of resuscitated drowning patients. This farther compounds the degree of difficulty and likelihood of ARDS. I'd recommend using a salad technique for a suction-assisted laryngoscopy and airway decontamination for these often contaminated airways. Now, this is my main point. When you've secured the airway and you're no longer running an active ode, know that all these drowning patients need an orogastric or a nasogastric tube placed post intubation. Drowning victims swallow a significant greater volume of water than they aspirate, and distension from getting positive printer pressure ventilation is common. Regarding mechanical ventilation, this is actually easy, and it was really highlighted over the last few years with the COVID 19 pandemic. You should follow an ARDS protocol, and you can prime your RT to expect this. In brief, this just involves increasing PEEP to achieve adequate oxygenation and using a low tidal volume ventilation strategy. Now, I'll introduce you to Sharon with the Miami J Cervical Collar Select Collection. And of course, this is from the United States. I actually added a few slides here because of your survey asking about the use of C-spine injuries and C-collars in the drowning patient. Thanks for responding to the survey. Now, I'd like to imagine Sharon as reading this article that came out in the Journal of Trauma that looked at C-spine injuries amongst drowning victims. There's over 2,000 patients. The results found that of over 2,200 patients, only 11 of them had C-spine injuries. Now, Sharon looks a little concerned here because that's not good for business. And when you go into the paper even more, all 11 actually had obvious signs of injury and they had a mechanism consistent with spinal trauma. Whether there's a history of diving, a motor vehicle collision, a fall from height, we often over collar these patients. And I wanna emphasize that D collars are in fact rarely indicated for drowning patients. For hypothermia, I'm gonna direct you guys to Dr. Mark McKinney's excellent grand rounds on the topic, but I'll say a few things. The temperature of thermally neutral water, that is where your heat loss is balanced by heat production, is 34 degrees. An indoor lane pool, like at your local YMCA for competitive swimming, that's 27 degrees. And if you go back to your basic, you know, our science classes on convection, conduction, we know that a person immersed in cold water loses heat about 25 times faster than someone exposed to cold air. So it's not really a question of if this patient is gonna get hypothermic, but when based on how long they're in the water. Here's our Ottawa hypothermia protocol. I won't go through this. I wanna highlight though that all unwell drowning patients require core temp monitoring and rewarming. For clinically significant electrolyte abnormalities, there really aren't any. Uh, initial thoughts about this came from case reports that were done in the Dead Sea. 
And then there were later these canine studies back in the 1960s that showed you need a ton of water to cause any clinically significant electrolyte abnormalities. So there was intubated canines and they dumped a lot of water. So 44 mils per kilogram of body weight down their ET tube, which is massive because I told you just already about the other studies causing those big changes in lung compliance with as little as one to three mils per kilo of body weight. They found they didn't start to develop any clinically significant electrolyte abnormalities or hemodilution until you get more than a dozen mils per kilo down the ET tube or in the airways. And that's a lot more than your average drowning patient will go on to aspirate. Uh, for antibiotics, just don't give them. Unless the patient drowns in heavily contaminated water, and by heavily contaminated, I mean sewage, uh, they're not needed. So this includes not for rivers, not for oceans, not lakes, not even hot tubs. If patients do go on to develop a pneumonia, it's typically day three to four in your ventilated patient while they're in the ICU. This is best left to your intensivist colleagues. How about surfactant? I talked to you guys at the beginning about surfactant being washed out. And this was from a randomized trial of 20 intubated sheep. Uh, actually, no, this wasn't sheep, this is rabbits. There was a lot of, <laughs> a lot of animal studies. And um, they were intubated, they drowned them, and they dumped five mils per kilogram of surfactant down their ET tube. This essentially just worsened their drowning with worsening hypoxia. So this hasn't been studied in human case reports beyond a few cowboy-like reports, so it's not recommended. Cancelled. How about nitric oxide, a pulmonary vasodilator? No evidence, also cancelled. Steroids? Because we know there's an ARDS-like picture going on. This hasn't shown evidence. Diuresis, right? If you think about the lungs of a drowning patient, almost like that of a CHF patient, right? They're wet. Why don't we give them Lasix? No evidence, also cancelled. Barbiturates, cancelled. Now let's take you back to the recess bay for a practice oral case to consolidate what you learned. You hear a patch call for a 10-year-old male who's just pulled from the water of your local leisure center in cardiac arrest. He's in a non-shockable rhythm with compressions ongoing and is three minutes out. I'd like everyone to take a moment to think through the steps of leading that drowning resuscitation. So you're aware of the hypoxic nature of drowning. You've called for a second MD and an RT to manage the airway. You brief them that this will be a soiled airway with higher resistance, difficult bagging, and that intubation should be done using a salad technique. RT is aware of ARDS ventilation settings. You have a Braslow tape on the bed and have calculated PALS medication doses. When they arrive, the patient's quickly transferred. Monitor is attached and unsurprisingly is in a non-shockable rhythm you rip off the patient's unnecessary C collar. At this point, the airway is being expertly managed when you obtain a core temperature and initiate rewarming. A pulse returns, you call a code ROSC, you decompress their stomach with an NG tube and order appropriate post-intubation sedation. You don't give them unnecessary antibiotics or fancy meds. Congratulations, you just saved a life. To summarize that for you, Anticipate the difficult airway in these drowning patients coming to your research bay. Consider a salad approach, ARDS ventilation parameters post. All these patients should get a core temperature and hypothermia rewarming part of their management. These spine injuries are pretty rare. Only consider it if there's a mechanism and they have external signs and symptoms. There aren't specific electrolyte abnormalities to expect and no antibiotics unless they literally drowned in sewage. Let's talk prognostics. So you might have seen media articles published on the miraculous recoveries that drowning patients can have. Uh, this one from Missouri, 
you can see this teen walking out of the hospital with his basketball after being submerged in an icy lake for 15 minutes just days prior. And this article came out in Time magazine talking about how an Italian boy survived more than 40 minutes underwater. So what is it, the factors that allowed these patients to survive? And I put this question to the group. What evidence-based prognostic factors can be used for drowning? Here's what you said. So the only factor you guys thought not to be associated with drowning was water salinity. Uh, that is our, you know, our fresh versus salt water drownings. And I'm glad that myth is being dispelled. But what about the rest? You might not know, but I took this question from the most recent 2020 systematic review by Elcor on the topic. They looked at those exact same six factors and they examined ROSC, survival to hospital discharge, survival with a good neurologic outcome. Now they found only one of these factors had evidence for their outcomes. And that's submersion duration. Which I will say, to our credit, in our group, 96% of respondents appropriately identified as a prognostic factor. Uh, they advised against all the other factors. And if you're curious about the research studies behind this, I'd encourage you to have a read of the article as they do a great job summarizing the evidence in each category. This is a sobering table from CHEST published last year looking at submersion duration and your probability of neurologically intact survival. Between the first two time categories of zero to five minutes and five to 10 minutes, there's almost a six fold increase in mortality. Past 25 minutes, it's virtually guaranteed. I'll say it again, submersion duration is the only evidence-based prognostic factor. Now, let's, well, let's move over to the urgent care part of our shift. This is a real case I saw on an ER elective just last month. So it was a seven-year-old boy. He went out skiing with his family and they came back to their hotel and he was playing in the hot tub with his dad. Dad maybe wasn't paying as close attention. He was under the water. When he came up, he was coughing a lot. He didn't lose consciousness and he was coughing for a few hours after. He comes in with mom and she says, well, I talked to a friend who talked to a friend who had this friend whose son died of this thing called secondary drowning. I just want to get him checked out. Looks a little something like this, perhaps a little less pale looking. <laughs> and I put this case to our group, and this actually really split the room. So about 45% of you said you would discharge this kid home. And 35% of you said you'd observe him for six hours since the event. And that's what Rosen says. And the evidence, not just Rosen's, will suggest that 35% of you are correct. The answer is B. I'll walk you through the evidence. So the first question I ask myself quite simply is, is this patient symptomatic? If they're not symptomatic, they haven't had symptoms, they didn't have a cough, stop there. That's not drowning, it's simply water exposure. Send them home. If they are symptomatic, and I mean, they have even like a minor cough, uh, I wondered if there's a scoring tool to stratify their risk. There is, but I'd advise against using this because there's better evidence. This was a retrospective uh, single center derivation study, and it was never validated, but it was incorporated into a larger review of the topic back in 2021. This came out in resuscitation once again. They found five articles and it looked at ED observation times for those well patients, including when they might decompensate and the criteria that could safely predict discharge. This was the summary of their results. So six hour period of observation is okay. if just three criteria are met. So if they have normal mentation, normal vitals, and they haven't needed oxygen. 
I was intrigued because they didn't talk about chest x-ray, although a few of the studies did. So when, if ever, should you chest x-ray these drowning patients? Well, it doesn't correlate with clinical outcomes, and the considerations you should have are only twofold from these studies. That of an abnormal lung examination and an abnormal oxygen saturation. I was just at CHEO this last week, and I talked to Dr. Alan Sheffrin, who endorsed that there is no CHEO algorithm for drowning, but generally six hours of observation is their group's accepted practice. And similarly, they're only X-raying if there's focal findings or a low SAT. So what about secondary drowning? I think about it a bit like Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. It just doesn't exist. There was a big article that came out in CHEST in 1997, and this looked at over 41,000 rescues that happened in Brazil. They divided drowning into six categories. Category one was just drowning, and they had a cough. With over 1,000 patients, their mortality rate was 0%. No one in that group who drowned and simply had a cough went on to die. Now, at the beginning, I promised you I'd take you through a few wilderness med survival strategies that could one day save your life. I have three for you based in the water, that of a sinking car, open water, and falling through ice. Falling or being in your car and going into the Ottawa River is the first question I asked you. You only had two options. You either get out right away or you stay in the car till it sinks. Here's what you said. 85% of you would try to get out right away. And I was on board with that. 15% of you, which I thought was crazy, said you'd stay in the car till it sinks to the bottom, and then you try to escape. But there's a formal survey done of the general public, and they found that over half of respondents thought staying in the vehicle when it sinks was the safest option. And this advice often appears in popular media. So what's the evidence show? The 85% of you guys in the room are right. The best time to escape a submerging car is immediately during that initial flotation phase. The cabin of the car is filled with air and it's a gas filled structure. It's not expected to sink right away. In fact, you probably have, you have at least 30 seconds, if not more than two minutes to get out. During this time, you wanna get your seatbelt off, open a window or two, and get out. A few points I'll emphasize is that the front of the car is often gonna sink first, because that's where the engine bay is and that's where the majority of the weight is. You also should never try to escape or kick out the windshield because that's reinforced glass. That's the strongest glass in the car. If you are to get out or if you need to break a window, you should go at the passenger side windows. And say the electronics on your car don't work anymore because you're stuck in the water, you can use the headrest of your car, and I, I love this guy's face, he looks just ready to smash. And you go for the corners of the window, because that's where the weakest glass is. So not in the center of the side panels, but you're gonna go towards the corners. From Wilderness Med Survival Guidelines, they have this slick acronym called SWOC that I can't take credit for. But they say if your car is ever in water, you should remember this, seat belts off, windows open, out immediately, children first. Now this picture is from a YouTube video on how to survive being lost in the ocean. This is scenario two. Really, after any immersion in cold water, you have a very limited time period to escape before fatigue and incapacitation render self-rescue impossible. If you have the opportunity at all to swim to safety, do that right away. If that's not an option, refocus your attention to your breathing. And I'll show you this technique. It's called the HELP position, or the heat escape lessening position. We would teach this to our junior lifeguards, and this is just to decrease heat loss while you're waiting in the water. It's really focused on minimizing heat loss from your armpits, your groin, your axilla. If you're in a group, you can also huddle in a group. And of course, because we live in Ottawa and there's the skating and Rideau Canal, which I don't know if it will open this year, but if it does, it would be dangerous. 
I'll show you a picture of what you should do. In fact, in video from ABC, and if you ever fall into ice. And just kick your legs and just try and pull yourself along the ice. Like swimming on top of the ice. Like swim on top of the ice. Get no special wet or dry suits. Kick the plunge. You know, just walking along. And... Mind numbing cold. But I acclimate, adjust my breathing, then remember my instructions. I kick and pull my way to safety. But as this thermal imaging camera shows, my toes and extremities were blue and cold. But that's just from the original exposure to the freezing water. My core is fine. I'm not hypothermic. Going to get back in? But no warmth for the weary. Oh, yeah. We'll stop it there. <laughs> Let's conclude. So the truth is you may never find yourself in any of those three wilderness medicine survival scenarios. But I can guarantee you this, that there will be people in this room who will have the opportunity to be first responders to drowning. We're around water a lot more times than we are on a plane. As ER clinicians, I think we all have a unique skill set, and I'm not encouraging you guys to get in the water or perform some sort of rescue that's outside of your scope of practice. But I hope that when you're there for a drowning patient being pulled out of the water, that you remember what you learned in today's talk and that you feel confident in your skill set. I've summarized everything I want you guys to know over the next three slides. So if you want to take pictures, this is probably the time. In your first response care to drowning, I want you to remember ventilate first before compressions. Call for an AED early. Consider PEEP or other airway recruitment maneuvers. In your recess bay, anticipate that difficult airway. Consider a salad technique and ARDS ventilation parameters after intubation. These patients need a core temp and will be hypothermic, and that's a core part of your resuscitation. G-spine injuries are pretty rare. You don't expect abnormal electrolyte patterns or antibiotics aren't needed until they drown in sewage, and submersion duration is the only factor shown for prognostication. Finally, for your well-appearing drowning patient, Six hour observation period is okay if they're alert, they have normal vitals, and they haven't needed oxygen. Chest x ray only if they have an abnormal exam or abnormal SAT. And then finally, secondary drowning just doesn't exist. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge a lot of people that made this talk possible. My supervisor, Dr. Doran Drew. Uh, secondly, the physicians who contributed their expertise to my talk Dr. Dan Beamish, <laughs> Dr. Ariel Hendon. Dr. Christian Bayancourt, Dr. Shabazz Syed, my physician mentor. Finally, my beautiful wife, Meg. Here are my references, and I'm happy to take all of your questions.